Hey everybody, welcome. How many first time reInvent attendees do we have here in the room today? Oh wow, almost the whole room. Well, I'm glad you're here. Now you might be here at reInvent at your very first reInvent at this you know, 100,000 ring circus that AWS puts on every year. And you might, you, know, you might, if you're kind of a security minded professional, you might be looking at that surface area and thinking, Oh boy, this is vast. You know, it's designed to it's designed to host near literally every kind of workload with services all up and down the stack. If I'm trying to get control over this environment as a security perspective, do I have an untenable task ahead of me? Is the surface area just so vast that it's going to be hard it's going to be hard to get control of? And I'm here. My name is Becky Weiss. This is I'm Alan Halakmi. Um, and we are, we are here to give you some good news here. That although AWS offers many, a, many and a growing number of services, new features announced all week here at reInvent and throughout the year, actually to secure your cloud environment, there are really only a number of fundamental patterns that you need to master. And that's what you're here to learn about. In this hour, Alan and I hope to get you up to speed on kind of two, the, the two basic aspects that you need to understand, the fundamentals that you need to understand to secure any workload you have in the cloud. So we're going to be talking about network security, the network security controls offered by our virtual private cloud product. And then we're going to be talking about identity, identity and permissions management with identi AWS identity and access management. In order to do almost anything in AWS securely, you need to understand these, and it's not hard, and we think we can get you there in the next hour. And once you understand them, you can do everything, because these patterns repeat over and over again. And this is going to be, this is going to be a very concrete talk. This talk is for, uh, for practitioners, for those of you who actually do things. We're going to show you how a lot of these things are put together, so you can kind of go back and, and make sense of it and you know, get all of the details and documentation, but you'll have the fundamentals down. Okay, so before we talk about securing things in the cloud, we've got to talk about kind of where it is, right? Where is your network? Where is your AWS stuff? Well, in AWS, those of you who are using AWS already, you know that the unit of ownership of anything in AWS, the resources, the things you have in AWS, is the account. So you'll have an AWS account. If you work for an enterprise, you'll probably be using multiple AWS accounts. We're going to talk about that later. Now, physically where your stuff is, because again, you're going to secure something, you kind of need to know where it is. Physically where it is, well, it's in what we call an AWS region. Well, AWS regions, we have 19 of them around the world and more coming online all of the time. They are actual physical locations in the world, isolated from one another. So when, for nearly all of our services, except for those that only make sense as a global service, but for nearly all of our services, you're, de you're actually interacting with an instance of that service in a particular region. Okay, so we'll, you know, to make the picture easier, we'll focus on one region, but of course everything, you know, everything you do here, you can do it in one region, you can do it in another one just the same. Okay, so you get a region, it's a physical place in the world. These regions are divided into logically isolated, logically isolated parts of the region called availability zones. Now, as the name implies, this, this concept is very useful when you're trying to build high availability applications in the cloud, which I'm sure all of you are. We're not going to talk about that aspect here. Um, but for right now, availability zones, they are where, where specifically your resources are within a region. OK, now let's, let's get to your stuff. Well, you are going to have a network in AWS, one or more of these. This is a virtual private cloud. It's a virtual, your virtual data center in the cloud. This is your network. You control it. It has a number of useful security features that Alan is going to walk you through. Um, one of the th you, you control a lot of aspects of this network, including the uh, IP address space. So here, you know, the notation here means this network, everything in the network will be 10.0. something. something. That's what that notation means. OK, so now we have a network within a region typically spanning all of the availability zones. This is, a play, this is the network in which your infrastructure is going to go. Within your network, you have subnetworks, subnets. And these subnets, they're a, they're a unit of many things in a VPC. We're going to talk about the subnet as a unit of 
security and routing in your VPC. That's what we're going to focus on today. So you get your subnets in your availability zones and your VPC in a region in your AWS account. And finally, now we can have some resources in AWS. We can have some stuff. So here are some EC2 instances, for example, virtual machines in your virtual private cloud. OK, but that's not the only thing that can run in your network. Uh, you can run relational databases using our RDS, uh, our RDS service. You can run those in your VPC as well. Really, anything that's going to be running infrastructure, especially for you, is a service that runs in your VPC. Here's another example. You're running uh, Windows workloads. Uh, you might have Microsoft, our managed Microsoft Active Directory service running its domain controllers in your VPC. There are many services that run this way. Whenever there is managed infrastructure that AWS is running for you, it will go in your VPC. But that's not... That describes a lot of things that you're, a lot of infrastructure that you're going to be running, but it's not actually everything. You'll notice as you start to use AWS that some of the resources you're using, some of the resources you're interacting with, actually, they're in your region. The resources are in your account and controlled by your account, but they're not in your network. For example, very commonly, customers will store their data in Amazon's simple storage service. This is uh, in an S3 bucket, get object, put object. Well, that bucket's not in your network. It's owned by you, it's controlled by you, it's not in your network. Lots of other services work that way, like an SQS message queue. Again, SQS is not in your network. A DynamoDB NoSQL table, not in your network. A lot of these services, these services that are kind of work in sort of a serverless kind of a way where there is, wasn't infrastructure provisioned, you know, specifically for what you're doing, uh, those are running in Amazon's network in your region. So you have full control over these, and we're going to talk about how you fully control over these. You control these as much as the things in your network. But it's actually useful to know, know what's in your network and what's not in your network, because your security, the tools you're using to secure them differ according to where they are. Um, if they're in your VPC network, you're going to use the VPC security features to control the traffic flowing into and out of them, the traffic they can send out, the traffic they can receive in. We're gonna, we're gonna spend probably about the first half or so of this talk focusing on that. And then there's AWS Identity and Access Management. This is our permission control system, our authentication and authorization. And as you probably guessed, this is what you use to secure everything in your VPC. In your network, not in your network, this is how you secure access to everything. Now, of course, you might, be, you might be wondering, well, OK, you just told me there's two different places my resource could be. It could be the, either in my network or not in my network. How do I tell the difference? Well, there's a number of ways you can tell the difference. One, you know, one uh, telltale sign that you're about to provision a resource in your VPC is you get asked about VPC things like subnets and security groups. But another thing you can do, since this is a networking talk, you guys are networking people here, you can resolve DNS names. All of these services are accessible over a network. We give you an endpoint, a DNS name at which you can access them. Go and resolve that DNS name. See where it is. For example, if I'm using this RDS database, RDS gives me this, um, gives me this DNS name for it. I resolve it in my VPC, and I get an address that is 10.0.something.something. That means it's in my VPC. Whereas if I go to the endpoint I would have to talk to, the sqs.region.amazonaws.com endpoint, to talk to my queue in SQS, you resolve that, you see that's not in your VPC. That's some other IP address. So we're going to start, so I'm going to hand it over to Alan here, and we're going to start inside your network. We're going to talk about these simple, flexible, easy to understand, regardless of whether you have a networking background or not, tools that you have to control the traffic that goes into, out of, and around your network. Thanks, Becky. So Becky showed you this diagram earlier, right? So this is our context, but we're going to start with a perspective from inside a VPC. So there are three main levers that you can use when you secure your VPC environment. The first is called a security group. This is a stateful firewall that you place on network interfaces that are associated to resources in your VPC, most commonly EC2 instances. So it's a stateful firewall you can put on things in your VPC. 
The second is routing, so you can control the flow of data as it's leaving subnets in your VPC. That's your second lever. The third is gateways, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through, but notionally, when you have a VPC, nothing can actually get into it or out of it until you provide a gateway for that data. So let's start with security groups. So security groups are a super simple concept. It's something that's very easily relatable from kind of verbal description to actual implementation. So I've put up a concrete example here. You've got a, a website. It's got some EC2 instances. There's a load balancer in front of it and a database that is sitting behind it. So we can describe in simple words what we're trying to do here. We have folks on the internet. They want to get to the load balancer on port 443. In turn, that load balancer wants to send traffic to a fleet of EC2 instances. And those EC2 instances talk with, let's say, MySQL, right? So Amazon RDS running a MySQL uh, set of active or master slave um, multi availability zone uh, databases. So this is a fairly standard configuration, easily described. And the security groups follow this pattern, also very easily described. So if you were to look at the security group for the application load balancer, so we have security group we've put on the network interfaces for that load balancer. And if we take a look at the inbound rules, again, this is a stateful firewall. So we describe the rules from the perspective of the initiator, and AWS automatically takes care of the rules for the responses. So here you see that uh, inbound port 443 TCP from any source, so 000 slash zero, those things can get through. All right, easy enough. Now the application load balancer we said needs to talk to the EC2 instances. Security group inbound rule, port 8443, if the source is security group ending in 26A1. Now you'll notice that that's the same idea as the application load balancer security group. So what this is saying is that if the traffic is coming from an interface that is in that other security group, it's allowed inbound. And I'll talk in a minute about why that's important. So maybe not surprisingly, when you look at the database, it's security group, inbound rule, TCP 3306. That traffic is allowed inbound from the security group that contains the network interfaces for the EC2 instances. So why are we referencing security groups? Well, it's a really nice feature that's available to you. Remember at the top, we said anybody can get into the environment, right? Anybody from the internet can come in. And so we defined an IP address as the source. Well, if you're a least privileged crowd, and you are a least privileged crowd, you want to actually be very specific about where traffic can flow. And because we provide a scalable infrastructure with things like auto-scaling, as your EC2 instances scale in and scale out, you really want to be specific about those EC2 instances having access, for example, to your database. By referencing the security group and including that security group in your auto-scaling configuration, the infrastructure automatically understands which instances are allowed to access. The other option you have would be to provide an IP address, let's say, for the subnet where your EC2 instances sit. But that's not really least privilege, because you're going to open it up to that subnet. And then any EC2 instance that launches in that subnet, whether or not it should have had access, is going to have access. So you can use security groups as an abstraction to track individual instances. Uh, and AWS will do that on your behalf. Second lever, routing. So as Becky mentioned, Subnets in AWS are many things. They're a unit of IP addressing. They're a unit of availability. For our purposes, they're also a unit of routing. And from a least privileged perspective, that's material. Every secured, I'm sorry, every subnet is associated with exactly one route table. So if we zoom in, put two subnets up, let's say that I have a workload running in the lower subnet. It's a series of EC2 instances. They're interacting with uh, a Redis cluster, doesn't need to communicate with the internet, right? They're just kind of, uh, it's doing the work uh, inside of that subnet. Well, if I don't want those instances to be able to get to the internet, I simply don't provide a route to the internet for those instances. So if I take a look at the route table that's associated with that subnet, you see what we call the local route. Every route table in AWS has this local route. 
And what it says here is effectively, anything in the VPC can get to other things inside the VPC. But notice there's nothing here that says anything about how to get out to the internet. So these instances could talk to other things in the VPC, provided, for example, the security groups allow it, but they can't get to the internet, they don't have a route out of the subnet. But let's go back to our prior example. What about the web application where I actually have traffic I want to come into the environment? Or let's say I need a bastion host so that I can get from the internet to my jump box and then into those EC2 instances that are processing in the subnet on the bottom. Well, it turns out if you want to get connectivity to the internet in AWS, five things have to be true. Number one, you have to have a public IP address. Well, you can see in the diagram that my bastion host has an IP address, a public IP address, and my application load balancer does as well. Number two, the security group has to allow the traffic. We just talked about that. The third thing that has to be true is something called a network access control list has to allow the traffic. I'm not gonna get into what the network access control list is here. For the purposes of uh, the conversation here, you should know that it is a stateless packet filter effectively that you can place on your subnet. But suffice to say, that has to allow the traffic through. The last two things, you have to have an internet gateway attached to the VPC and your route table has to have a route to it. So if those five things are true, the resources are accessible. Now, in AWS, we use a bit of shorthand. We call this a public subnet. You might imagine, then, that the subnet on the bottom is called a private subnet. The only difference between these two, public subnet and the private subnet, is that the public subnet has a route to an internet gateway. Otherwise, these two things are, uh, for all intents and purposes, identical. This is what the route table looks like. I mentioned you have to have a route to an internet gateway, and you can see here there's a route 0, 0, 0, 0, slash 0, all IP addresses, next hop, internet gateway. Now there are some cases where you have, let's say, EC2 instances that are sitting in a private subnet that need to reach out to APIs that are provided by a third party, or they need to reach out to download patches, for example. In those cases, you have a desire from a configuration from a least privileged perspective to allow outbound traffic and only outbound traffic. So the way that you can do this is to use a VPC NAT gateway. This is a managed NAT uh, offering that AWS provides that provides source NAT. And so what happens is if I update my route table for that private subnet and I say the default route 0000 slash 0, is a NAT gateway. The traffic will go from the private subnet to the NAT gateway. The NAT gateway will change the source IP to its own. It has a public IP address. It goes out the internet gateway with its uh, route to the internet. Whoosh. The lines are the best part. Third item on the list is gateways. So as I mentioned from the start, when you create a VPC, there's actually no way to get into it or out of it, which sometimes for customers that are just uh, starting to use the platform is a bit counterintuitive. Because you can see it in the console and you can see EC2 instances in the console, but traffic can't get in or out of it. And from a data flow perspective, that's true until you put a gateway on your VPC. So we already talked about the internet gateway. We talked about NAT gateway. There are other types of gateways, virtual private gateway. We just launched one yesterday called a transit gateway that helps with edge routing. But you have to have a gateway to get data into or out of your VPC. One advanced concept, which is super useful just to make you aware of, you can go read the docs later, is something called a VPC endpoint. So what, what I've shown here is two different VPCs. The one on the right is a producer. Let's say it has a web service. The one on the left is a consumer. So in the producer account, we have a series of EC2 instances. There's a load balancer in front of it. And the load balancer is effectively projecting a network interface into the consumer account or into the consumer VPC. Now, if we use Becky's trick about DNS, if you resolve that DNS, IP, that DNS name, you find the IP address is the VPC local IP address space. So I didn't have to create an internet gateway. I didn't have to use 
VPC peering, which is a capability that allows you to effectively do land-to-land -land connectivity between VPCs. Instead, I was able to scope very discreetly to a specific capability or specific API being exposed to a consumer. There are a number of nice things about this approach. One is it becomes very easy as you scale to understand what connectivity is available from which consumers. So the producer has a list of all the consumers, and each of the consumers can see that they have a connection to that VPC endpoint. The other thing that's nice is that you don't have to coordinate IP addresses. So in typical networking, if you have overlapping IP addresses and you're trying to connect things, that's a bad day. You have to do like double NAT and really nasty things, right? Here, AWS takes care of it for you with VPC endpoint. That load balancer provides source NAT, and so on the producer side, all of the inbound traffic looks like it's coming from the IP addresses of the network load balancer. Amazon takes care of the address overlap for you. So this is great if you're sharing, let's say, microservices, or you have customers, or you're a SaaS provider. But you can also do this with AWS services. So here I've shown um, Amazon CloudWatch logs. It's a great service for aggregating logs, application logs, system logs, and so on. One way to connect to Amazon CloudWatch logs, which is completely secure, no reason uh, not to do it from a security perspective in aggregate, is you could put public IP addresses on all of your EC2 instances, add an internet gateway, and send logs. But again, you're a least privileged crowd, and if you don't need a route to the internet, why put one in? Well, you could go one better. Oh, and I, I just noted here that the CloudWatch logs is sitting outside your VPC, right? That's why you need the internet gateway. So you could do one better. You could use uh, the managed NAT service. So now you don't have public IP addresses on your EC2 instances. However, you still have a route to the internet. So we can probably do better than that as well. Well, it turns out that AWS does provide VPC endpoints for services. So I can create a VPC endpoint for CloudWatch logs. And as you might expect, it now appears as network interfaces inside your VPC. No internet gateway required. It is effectively a local hop in the VPC network. So I should mention that we have two services that operate VPC endpoints in a slightly different way. The mechanics of how it works aren't terribly important, but um, what I would tell you is that for S3 and DynamoDB, the way that you use the endpoint is through routing. So Amazon provides something called a prefix list. You can see it uh, in the second row in the route table here that aggregates all the IP addresses, in this case for S3, and we say the next hop is that VPC endpoint gateway to get to S3. Hang on a second, Alan, I got a question for you. Yes, Becky. Okay, we, you just talked about you know, the great uh, security controls offered by VPC to you know, give you full control over the traffic into and out of your VPC, but who controls those controls? How did, who, who gets to change security group rules? Who gets to change your routes? Who gets to create endpoints? So all of that is the magic of AWS Identity and Access Management, which I would love for you to share. Thank you very much, Alan. How was that for a segue? We worked hard at that. Um, so yeah, it's true. Um, anything you do in AWS, literally anything, is controlled by uh, IAM permissions. So since you know the WS and AWS stands for web services, everything you do is either directly or indirectly done via a, uh, an API call to some AWS service, including changing your, you know, changing your security group rules in your VPC. That's a web API call to EC2. And every web API call to AWS is authenticated and authorized. So we're gonna talk about the system to do that. It works across AWS. Um, it actually doesn't take too long to get from zero to effective with IAM. And we're gonna look at specific policies. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna learn how to read and write these things. So we're gonna not only talk, we're gonna talk about the, uh, these resources that you have, this data that you have that you own, that you control, but that isn't in your VPC, so you're not gonna be using network controls on it, you're gonna be using IAM permission controls. But you're also gonna be using IAM permission controls on the provision, creation, deletion, modification of any of these resources, because at the end of the day, it's all an API call to AWS either that you're making directly through our SDK or you know, you're clicking on something in the console and the console's making an API call on your behalf. Okay, IAM, Identity and Access Management. 
The I stands for authentication and the AM stands for authorization. It works everywhere, you need to understand it. So all, uh, all API calls to AWS, um, except you know, for a couple that are you know, specifically meant to be unauthenticated, there aren't too many of those, almost everything requires that the caller have an identity, that it be somebody. Well, one kind of somebody you could be is a human, an IAM, a human IAM user. If you've ever logged into the IAM console with uh, like a long-term credentials, like a username and a, and a password, or if you've ever used those, uh, those, uh, those, the credential pairs, like an access key ID and a secret key, and you've configured your command line interface or your SDK with them, you're using long-term credentials. Long-term credentials are IAM users um, typically map to human users. How many of you in this room are human here today? How many of you are robots? I knew they, this is this reinvent. There's, there's always the edge cases. Well, another interesting use case for uh, accessing IAM, for accessing resources in AWS is when you're an application, when you're an automated process of some kind, when there isn't a human behind it. You know, for example, I might be running an application either on EC2 instances, in a VPC, of course, or I might be running it completely serverlessly as you know, my code in a Lambda function, and it's very, very common, and way more common than not, for that application to have a need to access, let's say, some data in AWS from one of our services. So I have a picture of Amazon DynamoDB here, so you can imagine this application that might be running on EC2, that might be running on Lambda, having to access data in that DynamoDB table. Well, again, how do you access data in a DynamoDB table is you make API calls to AWS DynamoDB. You, uh, you, know, you might call get item, you might call put item, you might call query. You need to be somebody in order to make that call. So an IAM role, what's different about an IAM role from, a, from an IAM user, and for the purposes of a security crowd, what's better about it is that it uses short-term security credentials. Now, this is taken, if you're running on EC2 instances, natively support running as an IAM role, same with Lambda functions, same with ECS tasks, same with a lot of our, uh, our compute platforms. Um, you can run them as an IAM role, and when you do that, the machinery of the EC2 instance itself, AWS takes care of retrieving and making available and refreshing these temporary security credentials for you. What that means to you is that your developers write their application code without handling credentials at all ever. They just say run is the identity of the EC2 instance that I find myself on. This is very handy because it, it skips a whole set of snafus that can happen when human beings handle credentials. So this is wherever you can use an IAM role, do use the IAM role. One other thing I'll quickly draw to your attention is in fact AWS itself when it's running services in your account to manage your, uh, to manage your resources. I have application auto-scaling as an example. It's a really handy service that will increase and decrease your uh, provisioned uh, I.O. for your DynamoDB table. Very handy service. Well, it's changing the provisioning on your DynamoDB table. So if you look under the hood, and I actually encourage you to look under the hood, and you turn on one of these services, you'll see that a role gets created, a role that can be assumed by an Amazon service. One more use case for roles that I'm just gonna touch on. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this because it's a little bit more of an advanced use case. But if you, work, uh, if you work at an enterprise, this is worth knowing about and learning some more about if, if you think it applies to you. Very common use case at our enterprise customers is to have their human identities in a corporate directory, like an active directory kind of thing, say, with users that are members of groups and those groups confer certain privileges. Well, if you're in a directory that supports SAML, we support SAML federation. So what that means is that your users will be authenticating against your corporate directory. That's nice because there isn't a new set of long-term credentials for them to handle for AWS. So they use their normal, normal corporate username password, and then we take care of bringing you into AWS, and they get to be a role. You set up the rules to map which groups go to which roles. So they're a role then, they have short-term credentials, um, and again, they get to be somebody in AWS so they can call things. So all of those identities that I just talked about, the umbrella term that we use for them across AWS is an IAM principle. An IAM principle is an identity and it could be a user or a role in, in IAM. Wherever you get a choice, bias towards using roles because they have the short-term credentials. Now who you are is only half the story, right? 
now that I know who's making this API call, and the way you identify yourself is your SDK or your CLI will actually do an HMAC signature using the secret part of your credentials. It'll sign the whole request so it can't be tampered with. So AWS can check that signature, make sure you are who you say you are, make sure the request hasn't been tampered with along the way. But of course, then there's a question of can you actually do this thing that you're trying to do? And that's where IAM policy comes into play. IAM policy is our authorization language in AWS. It's readable JSON. Um, it's actually, we're gonna start by talking about how IAM policy can be attached to IAM principles because that's by far the most common use of it. But actually later in this talk, we're gonna talk about a number of other places where you can put an authorization policy to secure, to create secure perimeter on your network, to create a secure perimeter around your resources. You can use IAM policy in a number of places, but we're gonna start with the most common use, which is on an IAM principle. So everywhere in IAM, you have to be somebody to make a call. You have to sign it with your credentials. And then an a AWS, the service that you're calling is going to authenticate your call, make sure you are who you say you are. And then it's gonna authorize it. Look at the policies that are relevant to this call, including policies on the principle, including policies that are there at other places uh, that are relevant to the request that we'll talk about later. And if the policy says you can do it, if you're authorized to do it, you get to go and make that call. Uh, one thing I would encourage you to look at as you're learning about AWS, um, go into our console, look at the ma AWS managed IAM policies. These are curated policies that we've written, typically useful, I would say, for human users. Um, like I searched for the ones relevant to DynamoDB here, right? And you see there are a number of ones with kind of descriptive names. I would actually encourage you as you're learning how to read and write IAM policies, go and, go and look, you can look at what's actually in those policies, go and read a few of them just to kind of understand what permissions, what kinds of permissions are necessary to do various common categories of things in AWS. It's handy for, your, for attaching to your human users, but it's also actually I find handy as a, a learning tool. But let's learn how to read and write these things. Okay, I've written a very short policy here. Uh, you can probably kind of piece together what this is talking about. A policy's got a few uh, a policy's got a few clauses in it. So first of all, we say whether it's allow or deny, which you know means what you think. Most of the policies I show you today will, will be allow policies. They're just easier to reason about. All right, actions. What can or can't you do? Now, as you can see here, wildcarding is supported. So what you got here is EC2 colon star. That means any action in the EC2 service. And then finally, resource. What can or can't you do it to? Again, wildcarding supported. Now, since I didn't put a lot of restrictions on this policy, it really means that whoever has this policy uh, attached to them is authorized to take any action in EC2 or VPC within the account, right? You can't grant yourself permissions to somebody else's account, um, but you can grant yourself permissions to anything in that account. So that's what that policy tell is telling you. Okay, we like least privilege over here in this room, so let's see if we can do better than this. Okay, maybe some specific rules here, right? These are the API calls that you make. Um, you remember those security groups from Allen. That is your number one most useful network security tool. So maybe you want to give whoever has this policy permission to authorize and revoke access to, access to traffic in the, uh, in the security groups. Okay, so that's what this one means. Can we make this even more specific? Well, what about this resource thing? Okay. If you look at this one, what this one means is that they're allowed to change the security group rules on this specific security group, right? Maybe I have, maybe there's a security group that their application runs in. Remember that the security groups typically map to different tiers of the application. So if you remember that application Alan had up there, there were three security groups in their load balancer, application instances, and databases. Maybe you would list out those three resources for you know, whatever developer is operating that, uh, that environment so that they could you know, modify the security groups there, and then they would get to modify their security groups and not other security groups in your account. Now, if you wonder what this verbose notation here is, this is an Amazon resource name, ARN. You're gonna see them everywhere across Amazon, so I'm gonna show you what that is made of. Um, the format for these, you don't need to remember this. Um, just, you know, when you see this, you'll know that it's an ARN. 
all of these fields here, they together, they it's a fully qualified name. It uniquely identifies your resource across all of AWS. OK, let's see if we can get even more granular than that. There's another optional clause that you can put in your IAM policy, and that's a condition. And a condition means that this, pol you know, this, th this stanza attaches if the condition is met. So maybe I have this, I, maybe I have this, net maybe I have this network engineer in my group, and I want him to have, I want him to do the security groups for this VPC. I might have multiple VPCs in my account, but I have a specific VPC in mind that I want him to manage. Well, so over here. I would say resource star, any security group, but the security group has to be, and the condition is that the VPC has to be equal to that one, and there's another ARN right there. So that is a condition that is, of course, specific to EC2. Only in EC2 would you be talking about the VPC of the resource that you're talking about, and each service offers its own set of conditions that is you know, relevant to what actually happens in that service. Um, but here's another condition. We also have conditions that are AWS-wide, that work across AWS services. So for example, over here, I'll give you an example of DynamoDB, because this is, this is for the services that you use that hold data, this might be of interest to those of you in the crowd who are concerned with um, data residency, like where your data is. What this policy means, this policy says dynamodb.star, they can do anything with dynamodb in the account, but there's a condition here that says that the region must be the Ohio region. So basically what I've said here is, whoever has this policy, they can use dynamodb in this particular region. A useful, this is a useful condition key for anything that holds data. If you have concerns over data sovereignty, you can use IAM policy to whitelist a known set, a known approved set of regions that your data could be in. OK. So that was your crash course in reading and writing IAM policy. Really, if you've made it with me this far, you now know how to IAM. And really, the rest, the rest you can do by looking at IAM documentation. Um, we have a documentation page in the AWS docs. It is my favorite page in the docs. It says AWS services that work with IAM. And it has links for each and every one of our services where you can go and look at what conditions are, what specific conditions are applicable, what, how you specify the resources for those actions. But this pattern, it just repeats everywhere. Now, your network security controls and your permissions controls actually work together in AWS. And I want to close out this section by showing you how this works. Here's like, here I have this uh, application deployed on EC2 in my VPC. Um, Let's say these EC2, the application needs to get to this S3 bucket. That's what it does. Now remember the S3 bucket, it's not in my VPC, um, but the EC2 instances are. And since I'm doing security right, my EC2 instances, they both run under an IAM role that gives them permission to do what they need to do in S3. And also, what I'm not showing you here, they're a member of a security group that is you know, limiting the traffic into them according to what I expect. So now, of course, it's running as an IAM role. IAM roles are identities in AWS. IAM principles have policies attached to them. So I've written this role. This role is allowing access to the S3 bucket. From a network perspective, um, I want to do routing. I want to do least privilege routing. These EC2 instances, I'll tell you, they don't have any other need to get out of the VPC to get to the internet. They're just trying to call S3 to get their data out of the S3 bucket. So again, routing for least privilege. I'm using a gateway endpoint to the S3 service, and I have routes to that from my VPC. So that's great, but there's actually more you can do with this gateway endpoint. The gateway endpoints to, the gateway endpoints to S3 and DynamoDB, as well as the interface endpoint to AWS code build, and we expect the set of services supporting this to grow over time supports putting a policy. You remember I said that policies go on principles, but they also go on other things? Well, you can put a policy on your VPC endpoint. So what this means, what we just did here, it, and that policy, I'm not showing you one here, but it looks very similar to that principal policy that we talked about before. Really, the only additional clause it has is the ability to restrict on who's calling, like what principles can make the call. What I'm doing here is I'm using my VPC network as a security perimeter. 
in AWS. What this policy means, I can write a policy that says, from this network, I know that only these couple of buckets are expected to be accessed from this network, nothing else. Or from this network, I expect all of the callers to be from this particular AWS organization. So I can put a condition like that. You get the full richness of IAM policy, except you're doing it at the network level. And it's common to combine these. And actually, there's a third place you can put policy in this picture here, and that's on the S3 bucket itself. Like I said, there's a couple of places you can put policy. Principles are one of them. The network is another one via VPC endpoints. And a, yet a third one is about 20 of our services support resource-based policies. In S3, you'll see this called a bucket policy. This is an IAM-looking policy that gets attached not to a principle, but to the bucket that says who can talk to it. So on this bucket, I can say, I only expect traffic from this VPC endpoint, not from the internet, not from other VPCs. So I can say, unless the traffic's coming from the VPC endpoint, I'm going to deny it. And that means even if you had some uh, IAM principal running outside the VPC who has a policy that says they can get to this S3 bucket, it'll get denied because it's not coming from the right network. So you put all of these three together, and you have a really good kind of least privileged combination at various points. The principal says what it can do. The network says what can happen coming from the network, and the resource says who can get to it. So that's three different places that you have to use network and permissions controls together. Now, we know, since this is a talk for practitioner, and since Alan and I are certain, certainly practitioners, we know that these things always work. Uh, it's easier to learn things if you see concrete examples, if you actually see something put together that's using these concepts. So we're going to spend the rest, of, we're going to spend the time remaining in this talk to go through a couple of, uh, to go through a couple of example scenarios that are using both permissions and networking controls to create a good best practices secure environment. Thanks. So in all these examples, we're effectively going to ask two questions. What is the network path and what are the IAM controls that are involved? In this kind of dual question, um, approach you should just ask every time you're putting something together in AWS. This will always hold as a pattern. So a very uh, common use case is to have a bastion host where you want to allow inbound traffic to uh, some EC2 instance, and then from that EC2 instance, allow onward access to uh, other resources, typically EC2 instances as well. So you can imagine SSHing to an EC2 instance, this bastion that sits in a public subnet, and then from there, forward, uh, onward SSH to these other EC2 instances. And as we said, the network question is, what network controls need to be in place? Well, for the public subnet, remember a public subnet just means that it's a subnet with a route to an internet gateway where my bastion host is sitting. I want that subnet to allow inbound traffic and I want to restrict my security group to only the known IP addresses that I'm going to be coming from. Right? I don't want to just open this up to the internet. OK, fair enough. So I have my security group that does that. And then for the EC2 instances in my private subnet, that security group will allow inbound traffic from the security group that contains the bastion host. Very simple setup, right? From an IAM perspective, I've allowed whatever the permissions are that are required to configure these security groups. And that's all well and good. But something else that you could do is you could turn off SSH on that bastion. You could just get rid of the SSH on that bastion altogether, down the host or down the instance, and use an AWS service to provide access to those EC2 instances. So we have a suite of services um, called AWS Systems Manager. One uh, of the capabilities is called Sessions Manager. Sessions Manager effectively allows you to SSH. And so instead of having this bastion host, you can use your IAM credentials to authenticate to Sessions Manager and then use Sessions Manager to connect into your EC2 instances and give you shell access or interactive access. So again, what is the network path? In this case, there's no direct internet path to my VPC. I'm connecting to an AWS service. Perfectly secure way to do it. And that service, in turn, has access to my EC2 instances through an agent that's running there and the VPC endpoint that connects to Systems Manager. So again, the network flow is just in my VPC with the service no internet gateway, 
my network path is known, and IAM is helping control even access through Systems Manager, so I can apply policies on who can access Sessions Manager. And uh, actually, the great thing about what Alan just showed you was that you moved the, you moved the uh, identity part of this up into IAM, where you already have an identity and already have credentials. You move this from a situation where you're managing SSH keys into a situation where the authentication is already done for you by IAM. And you should look for the, throughout AWS, we have a number of services that offer something like this. RDS is an example of that. You should always look for opportunities to have IAM manage your, IAM manage your identities because you already have your credentials there and you don't have a new set of credentials to handle. Finally, one last concrete example I'm going to walk you through. There's a lot going on on this slide, and that's kind of the point here. If this slide contains services you've never used or never heard of before, don't worry about it. I'm going to explain what they do. And in fact, that's kind of the point. You may not understand the particulars of this, these services that I'm showing you. You may never have used them. But the security controls around them are going to be familiar. They're the same no matter what you're doing. So what do I have here? I have, I have a serverless workload over here. I'm using Amazon API Gateway. This is a service that you can put in front of an API, either a serverless API that you're running serverlessly on Lambda functions, or really in front of just any HTTP endpoint. Um, API Gateway offers a bunch of great functionality in terms of usage plans and, uh, and authentication and authorization. Great functionality here. So I'm running a API Gateway in front of my service. My service is implemented on Lambda functions. Um, they are going to get data from DynamoDB, but they're going to go through DynamoDB Accelerator. This is a service we have to take your milliseconds into microseconds, like really reduce the latency for talking to DynamoDB by, with an AWS managed cache in the middle, essentially. So I've got a bunch of AWS services up here on the board. And like Alan said, our job here is at every layer of the system, ask ourselves, how do we do least privilege with network security? And how do we do least privilege with permissions? So I'm going to start at the bottom here on the DynamoDB table. As I mentioned, DynamoDB is not running in your VPC. But the DynamoDB Accelerator, managed infrastructure on your behalf, it is. So first of all, the network perspective, if you need to get from your DynamoDB Accelerator in your VPC to the DynamoDB not in your VPC, and assuming that subnet doesn't have any other need for a route to the internet, well, so I can set up a VPC endpoint to do least privileged network connectivity to the DynamoDB Accelerator. All right, what about permissions? Well, the DynamoDB Accelerator, I know the patterns according to which it's going to be accessing data in the DynamoDB. It's, I know the particular table. I know the indexes it might be querying. Um, I know the actions it's going to be taken. DynamoDB Accelerator, like many other AWS services, runs under an IAM role. So in that IAM role, I give it permissions to do exactly in DynamoDB what, it, what I expect it to do, which actions in the actions part, which tables and indexes in the resource part. OK, let's go up a layer and again talk about networking and talk about permissions. I've got Lambda functions. That's where my application code is running. I provide the code, server, AWS serverless does everything else. Well, network. These Lambda functions, they need to get to my DynamoDB Accelerator, which I told you is running in your VPC. In fact, if you resolve its DNS name, you'll see that it's running in your VPC. Your Lambda functions need to get to DynamoDB Accelerator. This is traffic within your VPC. So the DynamoDB Accelerator is expecting, you can run lambdas in your VPC. That's what we're choosing to do here. When you do that, you tell it what security groups and what subnets. In terms of security groups, well, I'll put the DynamoDB Accelerator in one security group. It's going to run on port 8181 uh, or 8111. And your lambda functions, uh, and it's going to have a rule allowing ingress from the security group in which the lambda functions run, so that the lambda functions can initiate requests to the DynamoDB Accelerator. So that's how I did networking least privilege there. How do I do permissions least privilege? Well, Lambda functions, uh, just like many of our other compute platforms, allow running under an IAM role. So when I created the Lambda function, I also gave it an IAM role, anticipating what kinds of AWS resources it needs to access. Well, what does it need to access? That role is going to give it permission to take the actions it needs to against the DynamoDB Accelerator 
instance that I have. You know, actually, in practice, your Lambda function policy is also almost always going to have permissions to CloudWatch logs, because that's where it sends your logs. I don't show that on this picture, but these things are going to be shipping logs. OK, going up a level. API Gateway is going to be invoking my lambdas in my VPC. Well, how do I give API Gateway permission to invoke my Lambda function. Invoking a Lambda function is, again, a web API in AWS. Well, Lambda functions support resource-based policies. They're called function permissions in Lambda. So I have to tell Lambda, this is the API gateway. This is the API in API gateway. And you can look at our examples in our documentation for exactly the syntax for this. This is the API that's going to be invoking you. All right, so I just walked through every, le and in fact, a API Gateway itself, I'm not showing this in the picture, offers, uh, recent, recently announced uh, the ability to make a private API that you can, like many other AWS services, that API can be made available to its consumers privately in their VPCs. So I just walked through a number of steps here, and this is what you should do whenever you are going to be deploying a workload in AWS. Go through each block of your block diagram, Think about its networking needs. Think about its permission needs. Think about the most minimally scoped networking and, and permissions needs that they have. Think about these two things together because they often do go. They often do have a one-to-one -one relationship, and, um, and and you know and walk through that the way we just did. Now we're at the end here, and there's a number. The, security is a vast topic. You may have noticed we have a s session or two on security here at reInvent this week. There's a bunch of things that we haven't had the chance to talk to today, and I want to draw your attention to them as you're ramping up on our platform, as you're learning about what tools you have to secure your environment. Most importantly, we didn't talk about encryption of your data, and of course you should be encrypting your data, and AWS makes that really easy. The key, so to speak, service that you use for encryption in AWS is called KMS, Key Management Service. KMS happens to have really good fine-grained permission control with IAM. It works really well with IAM, so you can take very fine-grained control over who can use the key to encrypt and decrypt under what conditions. So that's something you should be looking at securing, because whoever has the key has access to the data. KMS also has super simple integration with our data services. And for many of our services, it's literally choose the key from a drop-down and then your data is just protected with that key in that service. So the integration is often very seamless. Another thing we didn't talk about, we, we've been talking about preventive controls here, guardrails, guardrails at the network level, guardrails at the permission level. And we haven't talked about how you see the effect of what you've done. And AWS offers a lot of visibility and detective controls to give you, um, one of the advantages of being in the cloud is you have unprecedented levels of visibility into what's going on in your environment. Nothing's going on in the darkness anymore. CloudTrail is a, ser Cloud Trail is a service that we tell all customers, pretty much just turn this on, make sure it's running. There's no reason not to run CloudTrail. And it gives you a full audit log of the API calls that happened um, in your account. And they've recently announced uh, support for multi-account environments for organizations. So if you run across, if you run, if you're gonna run a multi-account environment, you should be looking at CloudTrail's uh, recent announcements there. VPC flow logs is a full accounting of all of the network flows into, out of, and around your VPC. Five tuples, source port, destination port, source IP, destination IP, protocol. Um, you can get a full dump of that, either delivered to CloudWatch logs, so you could analyze it there, or dumped to uh, S3, so you can pick it up in bulk there. And then finally, higher level security services. Um, we have a growing set of these. These are, these are security services that help you stay on top of the security posture of your environment. Amazon Guard Duty, um, that's one that came out probably, I guess probably about a year ago now. Um, that's another one that we tell customers, just turn that on. It ingests your cloud trail, ingests your flow logs, and it will, it will produce findings for you. It'll flag anomalies you know, using, using our best threat detection. Inspector is a great way to uh, is is a great way to assess like the patch status and, and security posture of your individual hosts. So a number of things to learn about while you're here at reInvent or maybe when you go home. Um, Alan and I, if you didn't get enough of me and Alan today, 
Uh, you can come and talk to us some more tomorrow. We do a chalk talk on this related topic. You'll see a lot of this content here, but we'll open it up for kind of open Q&A in the audience. We're expecting a great discussion here. Um, and as you are starting to learn about AWS, um, there are, of course, many talks on the topic of network, on the topic of security, but there's one that I really recommend for customers who are new to AWS want to get, and want to get a hang of how the network works, because your VPC network really underlies your use of many AWS services. This is a great talk. Already happened this week, but that you can still catch it on YouTube. I find that this is a very good introduction to customers for like the connectivity features offered by VPC. And we just wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming today. I hope, I hope you're coming away. I hope you're going home armed with the fundamental knowledge of IAM and VPC so that when you go back, you know what questions to ask. You know what AWS is capable of doing to secure your workloads. That was our goal here today. I hope we achieved it. Thank you so much for coming out today and have a great rest of reInvent.